UN Women's uh, Regional Policy Advisor for Women's Economic Empowerment for West and Central Africa. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and serve as moderator. Before we go into the discussion, allow me a couple of practical announcements. Um, there is interpretation available in several languages, including sign language. So please select the icon at the bottom of your screens to, to select the language that you prefer to use today. And this session is being recorded and it will be available in the website of the forum in the next, um, during the next 30 days. We are day number one of Mexico City Gender Equality Forum. It's an exciting moment. It's a time for celebration and for reflection. We are taking a stock on the progress and the challenge made over 25 years of implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action. Our session today focuses on climate emergency. 25 years ago, perhaps this wasn't felt as such as an emergency, but it's clear today that this is a major, major challenge of our time and one that has clear implications for women and girls around the, world, around the globe. As we speak, we are also enduring the effects of a historic pandemic, one which is also having important disproportionate impacts on women and girls. So today, we hope to discuss the challenges and, and how uh, women uh, are affected by the impact of climate change, but more important, we are hoping to talk about the solutions, the good practices, the priorities that we want to see reflected going forward as we build back better post-COVID-19 and as we transition towards a more sustainable and inclusive economy. And for that, we have today with us an outstanding and very diverse panel representing different areas of society from private sector to policymakers, advocates and, and civil society. So without further ado, let me introduce the members of our panel today. Our first panelist is Ms. Hindu Omaru Ibrahim, co-founder and president of the Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad. And Madame Ibrahim, soyez la bienvenue. It's a real pleasure to have you with us. Second member of our panel is Honorable Dean Jonas, Minister of Social Transformation and the Blue Economy of the Government of Antigua and Barbuda. Honorable Minister, real pleasure to have you with us today. Our third member of the panel is Ms. Jennifer Uchendu, a found, the founder of Satsi Vibes, a youth-led uh, organization working for environmental sustainability in Nigeria. Welcome, Ms. Uchendu. Fourth member of our panel is Ms. Lucy Mulenke, Executive Director of Indigenous Information Network, a CSO working for sustainable development in Kenya. Thank you for being with us, Ms. Mulenke. Next member of our panel is Ms. Maya Vidakovic Lalich, Founder and Director of Belgrade Mixer Festival, a space for social, cultural creation around sustainable development and social innovation. Thank you for being with us. Our next panelist is Ms. Marta Delgado Peralta, Undersecretary of Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Welcome and uh, thank you very much for hosting us, um, Senora Peralta. Next member of the panel, hardly needs an introduction, is Her Excellency Mar Mary Robinson, former President of the Republic of Ireland, former UN Commissioner for human rights and currently the chair of the elders. So thank you for being with us. Uh, her, Your Excellency, it's a real pleasure to have, it, to have you here. And the next member of our panel is Ms. Miriam Miranda, coordinator of the Black Fraternal Organization of Honduras. Bienvenida, Senora Miranda. And finally, we also have with us Ms. Janine Alm Erickson, Secretary of State for International Development of Sweden, who will be doing a wrap-up session and uh, closing remarks for us. Uh, welcome, uh, thank you for being with us, Ms. Erickson. We also have a uh, fantastic audience joining us from different places of the world. So we encourage you to use the chat, introduce yourself, interact. There will be a moderator for the chat. We also ask you to uh, include your questions and comments and feedback in the Q&A section of Zoom, so we can pick up some of them at the end of the session and hopefully so that our panelists can respond to some of your questions. There will be two rounds of questions, uh, two questions for each of the panelists uh, and each panelist will have 
three minutes to answer. So without further ado, let me ask uh, our first panelist to start um, this discussion. So the first question is for Ms. Hindu Omaru Ibrahim. Madam Ibrahim, um, you come from Chad at the heart of the Sahel, probably one of the places where the impact of, of climate change is more felt uh, in the world. So could you tell us how is climate change impacting the, the lives of women in Chad and whether and how this has evolved over time? Madam Ibrahim, the floor is yours. You have three minutes. Thank you very much, Elena. Hi, everyone. It's so a great pleasure and honor to be with all the wonderful women in this panel. Hi, Mary. I cannot start without saying a special hi to you because you know the struggle from the local to the international level. Of course, Elena, you say it. Sahel is the heart of the climate impact, who is evident. And I am coming from Chad. And as you know, there is extreme weather events that every day increasing in the regions that I come from. So we are leaving the impact on two times. Firstly, the environmental impact we are seeing and then the social impact. The environmental impact we are seeing our season change a lot. And suddenly just the last uh, rain season, so it's just like a few months ago, we are facing the floods. Every place is flood and that flood our food, flood our crops and people's becoming homeless. And following the, the years before it was drought. Every part was dry and then we get the rain who cut from one uh, week to another week. So the consequence for us, it is the food insecurity, no discussions. When there is flood or when there's drought, it is food insecurity. And this impacted directly the social life of peoples. And that's why the women found themselves in a most vulnerable place. I am coming from a nomadic pastoral communities. Our life is depend from nature. If the rain come, we get our food. If they didn't come, we are not having any livelihood. We are not the peoples that depending from the end of the month salaries or going to the supermarket to buy food. Or everything from the medicine to the food we collected from the brood. And then when the climate change every day come, so the response from man and woman are different. So man, most of the time say, just to stay home, I'm going to look, I'm going to look for the food outside or for the job in another city. And that means the internal migrations that's taking our man very far from us. Who are left behind? They are the women. And those women are impacted because they are a lonely who have to fight for the food security. They are a lonely who have to fight for the security of the peoples. And they are a lonely who have to collect all the medicine and take care of the old peoples and young peoples. So climate change in my region and in my community become a night man who divide families, who divide communities and who let peoples just growing up without them father next to them or without them brother next to them. So climate change is a reality around all the Sahel. It's changed our life and livelihood. It is so sad to see when we come to the international level, it is completely disconnected with the local realities. So of course we can talk about the solution later, but those women are also a hero because they are creating a solutions even alone with the climate change impact. So I'm going to stop here, but it will be very important to return those two lessons. Firstly, our environment, our ecosystem are impacted. And this is climate change because we're already having the 1.5 degree and we're already losing all our natural resources. Secondly, women are the most impacted because we are the ones who are front line of the climate change and we are the ones who are collecting food, collecting water, and founding ourselves in a front line of all the climate impact. And thirdly, we are also the solutions. Even we are in the rural areas, we are the most marginalized. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madame Ibrahim, and thank you for uh, being so clear in your account and also for respecting the time. Next panelist, uh, it's uh, Miss Lucy Mulenke. We would like to also hear from you. You have been an activist for decades in this space. Can you tell us, continue in the same line as, as Miss Ibrahim, what are the, how are the ways in which climate impacting the women with whom you work in your communities? So you have, the floor is yours, you have three minutes. Thank you very much and uh, hello to everyone and uh, Your Excellency Mary Robinson and all the other members of the panels and also the Mexican government for hosting this. I think it's really great to listen to and to discuss these particular issues because they impact our lives no matter where we are, especially indigenous women. And uh, as I just continue to what Hindu has talked about and she's just brought the reflection of not only Africa but different parts of the, of the globe where indigenous peoples live. Climate change, impacts on different people, depending on their social and cultural roles. Looking at indigenous women, they are more impacted because of the way and where they live. They live in remote areas. They are the people who are not easily uh, reached by development. And therefore it's very important to know that they do not access easily with the climate change right away, as she has already explained, access to water, fuel woods, grazing areas brings conflict, especially because they, where they live, the natural resources are there and so there is competition and that competition also brings a lot of conflict and they are the ones who are impacted when men go away and look after their cows and try to get uh, to get greener pastures their health is impacted not only their health as women and girls but also the health of the family remember the women who are small scale farmers who are fisher folks and who are nomadic women like uh, uh, me and Hindu who comes from the pastoral areas, and we have to provide the food. The workload is increased, and this workload without food and without pasture makes them even impact on their health issues, and that affects all the family in general. So it's very, very important to know that this climate change impacts us in different ways. And as she said, there are solutions. The women have tried to come up with different solutions, but at the same time, despite the fact that they are resilient, they need more knowledge, especially in terms of adaptation and mechanism ways that they can be able to really uh, uh, you know, manage some of the uh, really workload that they have. Can we get them probably alternatives for cooking, for water uh, uh, harvesting, for better ways of um, uh, producing food, alternative ways of life? These are issues that we need to discuss a lot and make sure that at least they can understand. Let's look also at the ways that their lands are used and the land tenure systems and the implementation of those lands that they live in. Most of the indigenous peoples are impacted because of their land. And this land also brings a lot of impact on them and climate change because they are taken for large scale, uh, uh, you know, large, uh, large scale uh, uh, projects and it really displaces them where they are. Most of them are displaced, so that is where there is a big challenge also. So there are quite a number of concussion of issues and looking at what we are facing now, we need to uh, work together as a team and we need to look and share and learn from each other and see how we can complement what innovations indigenous women already have and how this can be also be adopted uh, generally within the, the, the areas of adapting to climate change. So I'll just stop there and then we can continue in terms of coming to solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Mulenke, for this clear account of the impact of, of uh, climate change on, on the women's of lives uh, in your region. And um, we are uh, heading next with a question for Her Excellency Mary Robinson. We are very lucky to have you, uh, to have you with us today. You've had roles in government, but also as an activist and you have a global perspective on the subject. In your opinion, what are the emerging strategies that can be implemented to reverse the course um, in, in this race against time that uh, it's climate change? What are some of the emer emerging strategies that should be in place? The floor is yours, you have three minutes. Thank you, Elena. And I'm also delighted to take part in this really impressive panel and to do it as feminists. Uh, we need to reinvent feminism in this broad, holistic way that we're doing, where we share and value each other 
And I want to very much reinforce the important points already made by Hindu and by Lucy, because they speak from a context that I believe is very important, the context of the injustice of climate change. Uh, we mustn't forget that. Um, there are layers of injustice. First of all, that it affects the poorest countries, the poorest communities, the indigenous peoples disproportionately. And they are least responsible. Secondly, it affects women more than men, as we've heard, um, and at all levels because of different social roles. Thirdly, the children remind us of the intergenerational injustice. Fourthly, there's an injustice of the pathways to development of industrialized countries who built their economies on fossil fuel and have to wean ourselves off now with just transition, and the developing countries who are being asked to develop without using fossil fuel, but haven't had enough access to investment in clean energy and the skills and the training that goes with that. And lastly, the injustice to nature. So I believe that we need to realize this year, 2021, is an absolutely vital year, perhaps the most important year in human history. So why do I say that? Because we have to bend the curve on emissions far more than we are doing. So we need to use the two big frameworks this year, the framework of the UN Conference on Biodiversity in China in October, it's been moved now to October, and the Conference on Climate in Glasgow, Scotland in November to urge governments to take ambitious steps, urge corporations to take ambitious steps that we all commit to be zero carbon by 2050, work backwards to 2030, but even more so, work backwards to now, 2021, 2023, 2025. What are governments going to specifically do? What are corporations going to do? What are cities going to do? And always bearing in mind this lens of climate justice, which must guide us, um, knowing that the impacts are so unfair in how they affect black and brown people, that's the racial injustice, the gender injustice, the poverty injustice, um, the injustice for people who are marginalized, people with disability. And it's through that lens of justice that I think we will get um, a good solution that will bring us on the path. And I love the idea, not of building back better, but building forward for justice, equality, and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for those ideas about how to really leverage the instruments that we have in the international architecture. Thank you very much. We are now moving to uh, our next panelist, uh, Ms. Maya Vidakovic. Same question for you, Ms. Vidakovic. What do you see as the emerging strategies that we need to put in place in the fight against climate change? Over to you, you have uh, three minutes. Thank you very much. Really greetings for everyone. It's really an honor to be here among these amazing ladies. Uh, speaking as someone from the grassroots organization and the um, um, independent sector in culture, we really want to stress us this opposite side of uh, real people in everyday life. So we understand that we need much higher awareness among citizens and consumers and they have really the power because they can influence political options and can motivate the private sector and be the correctional force for policies which are led in our name and also for industries and economic growth, which is again driven by our own needs and our own consumption. We uh, in uh, Serbia, we have proven working together with the very, very progressive team of UN Women Serbia that women are those change makers. We have done several research and uh, we have, you know, we have figures to talk to and to actually influence policymakers that women are much more eager and ready to embrace more sustainable and responsible lifestyles and changing their consumption and habits. It's also they're they're much more prone to invest their time and energy to influence other people to shift their behavior and change and inform their decisions uh, based on the kind of uh, benefits 
not only for their own personal gain, but also for the humanity. So emergent strategies, which are giving us hope, at least here in the Balkans, is um, investments of energy in bringing environmental crisis and climate emergency in the very core of the educational system and media here. We're doing a really like a groundbreaking work, trying to really bring these topics to uh, full attention because until recently there were really some side marginal uh, facts which are, weren't given the, enough of attention. Uh, so basically we're really hoping that by bringing this new generation of uh, women and girls, but of course, or other people, we will be able to influence uh, policies and also uh, really uh, work on uh, what uh, Mary really pointed out well on the justice along the way, because we of, of course all know that the accessibility to resources is really not uh, equal right now. And uh, we're working also in cities. So the, another really important top, topic maybe later is actually how to explore deeper linkages between climate change, gender, and urban environment and help cities to create gender sensitive, climate smart urban policies with full involvement of people and local governments and focus on mitigation, gender mainstreaming, of course, property rights of women and reduction of urban poverty, but with, with women on the leading positions. Because we also have these uh, numbers saying that women are really. Uh, trying to impl implement these strategies and policies which are really truly leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, um, for bringing also the urban agenda into the discussion. Um, we are moving now to our next panelist, Senora Miranda. Um, in your experience, um, can you tell us uh, why is it important that women are at the table why is it important that women participate in decision-making processes affecting the environment and climate change? And how, in your opinion, can we push for more accountability? The floor is yours, you have three minutes. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Un gran uh, saludo a todas, todos, todes. Eh, soy la única que no sabe nada de inglés pero tengo interpretación. Eh, muchísimas gracias también porque me han dado la oportunidad la Iniciativa Mesoamericana de Mujeres para estar con ustedes un ratito. Yo quisiera decir que abrazo todas las palabras de la señora Mary Robinson y me parece que la pregunta es pertinente, pero a estas alturas, con la situación de la crisis climática tan profunda, la grave crisis ambiental, yo siento de que ya no podemos hablar solamente que las mujeres que estamos enfrente tenemos que ser las que estemos en el centro eh, como responsabilidad y para poder dar la palabra, para poder dar opinión sobre el tema de la crisis climática. Estamos en una, y en una emergencia mundial, ya, ya requiere que inclusive pongamos la atención todos, todas y todes, o sea, ya no solamente de las mujeres, como mujeres seguimos estando al frente, estamos poniendo nuestro cuerpo, nuestro pensamiento, nuestro accionar, pero ya no, ya no basta, necesitamos la decisión política y de todos los sectores y que todas empujemos para salvar el planeta, el planeta está en crisis, la humanidad está en crisis y esa es una cosa que tenemos que poner en la atención, hay una emergencia mundial, yo invito que con este problema que hemos enfrentado en los últimos años con la pandemia, podamos también ponerlo a, al debate al mismo tiempo que la crisis climática, o sea, le, la situación de la pandemia no se puede hablar de la crisis climática sin hablar de la pandemia del COVID-19, no se puede, es algo ilógico que a esta altura hablemos de la crisis climática sin tomar en cuenta un llamado de atención mundial que tenemos en este momento con la crisis sanitaria que deriva de que necesitamos aire limpio, necesitamos ambiente limpio, territorio limpio, comer bien, estar preparados para las próximas y futuras crisis sanitarias que tengamos, bacterias, virus, etcétera, etcétera. 
Y yo siento que está totalmente ligado. No podemos hablar ahora separado. Tenemos que hablar juntos y tener esta oportunidad. Es una oportunidad única para poner atención a una problemática que nos lleva al planeta, al mundo totalmente, no solamente las mujeres. Las mujeres estamos enfrente. Es cierto que estamos poniendo nuestros cuerpos, es cierto que estamos poniendo nuestra resistencia, nuestras luchas por la defensa de los territorios, del medio ambiente, pero también las mujeres estamos hoy por hoy obligadas a hacer un llamado mundial para que sí, los que toman decisiones pongan atención a una crisis y a un, un problema planetario. Estamos en peligro como humanidad. Y yo creo que es importante que estos debates que se den a nivel internacional y mundial tomen en cuenta que no podemos separar la pandemia, la crisis sanitaria, de la crisis ambiental y de la crisis climática. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, señora Miranda. And now we are moving to um, a question for uh, Andes Secretary Delgado Peralta. Um, señora Peralta, um, you are already at the table. You are a woman in leadership. You are a policy maker yourself. So in your experience, how do we make sure that women participate in the design and implementation of climate, ch climate change strategies? And what are some of the good practices that you can share with us today to make sure that the voices of the different women are heard? The floor is yours. You have three minutes. Thank you, Elena. Gracias. I'm going to speak in Spanish. I think that we need to use languages and different languages. So, Miriam, voy a hablar en español. Me gusta eh, estar el día de hoy. Es un privilegio para mí muy grande después de haber participado en la conferencia de Beijing en 1995. Y desde entonces uh, lo que hemos visto son avances importantes de política pública que han establecido una preponderancia por la equidad, la inclusión de las mujeres en la planeación, en la ejecución, los beneficios de las políticas públicas. Y sin embargo no terminamos de ver uh, los resultados con la velocidad que necesitamos. Yo fui a Beijing siendo una joven ecologista y eh, ahora soy una funcionaria pública en el área de la política exterior. Me parece que los retos que tenemos los gobiernos son muy grandes, pero que tenemos a, a nuestro alcance la posibilidad de poder incluir todas las perspectivas en una nueva forma de diseño de esas políticas públicas. En materia específica para el combate al cambio climático, eh, ha sido muy particular el impacto que ha tenido el COVID-19 en la forma como han cambiado nuestras sociedades en muy corto plazo. No lo hemos podido lograr en 30 años de luchas ecologistas climáticas, eh, las mujeres, pero se ha podido lograr a partir de una gran amenaza como lo es esta pandemia. Tenemos que aprender cómo fuimos capaces de transformar nuestra manera de relacionarnos, nuestra presencia en el espacio público y también tenemos que reconocer la gran vulnerabilidad de las mujeres en esta pandemia porque lo que viene con el cambio climático va a ser todavía más difícil. Los aspectos de género tendrán que incorporarse eh, de manera muy importante y de estructural en los planes y programas de adaptación y mitigación al cambio climático. Debemos también hacer la tarea para incorporar todos los aspectos de género necesarios en el presupuesto de cada uno de los países. Debemos de hacer todo lo que esté en nuestras manos por incorporar las voces de las mujeres indígenas, discapacitadas, de la sociedad civil, de las académicas, del sector privado, las emprendedoras y las jóvenes para confeccionar las soluciones. Y finalmente creo que también debemos de analizar las estadísticas y los indicadores de género para poder usarlos para tomar las decisiones. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, um, Madame Delgado. Um, now we are moving to um, our next panelist, uh, Honorable Minister, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. 
You are a true he for she, and we are very honored to have you uh, in the panel. So from the point of view of, policy, of the policymakers, same question um, as for Ms. Delgado, how can we ensure that women participate in the de design and implementation of climate change and environmental policy and strategies? What are some of the strategies that you can share with us? You have the floors, you have three minutes. Minister, I think you are mute. We can okay, um, I'm sorry, I, um, I could not hear very clearly. Um, I'm assuming you're referring to me, um, Dean Jonas? Yes, uh, uh, indeed. Okay. The question Thank you very much. The question um, was for you. Thank you, <laughs> I wasn't hearing very clearly. Um, I'm very pleased to be a part of this esteemed panel today and um, I um, greet you all from Antigua and Barbuda. And um, I am very pleased to present to you my and my government impression. It is imperative for women's voices to be heard at the highest levels in decision making when designing and implementing risk presentation um, strategies that are relevant to the environmental crisis and disaster risk reduction. We can promote this by firstly engaging in widespread efforts to raise awareness on the level of representation that is currently lacking for women and girls, that is at the highest levels in government, as well as vulnerable groups. And this will hope, hopefully serve to increase the understanding and facilitate easier mobilization of from the general public, as well as potential allies and partners. We can also promote increased involvement of women and implementation of risks strategies by providing capacity building and networking, as well as knowledge sharing opportunities for women and girls in the area of environment and climate change. This will allow many women to be more competitive in terms of leadership roles within these fields and position them to be focal points that will contribute substantially towards the development and implementation of sustainable solutions. Some good practices that can be shared to have global transformation are examining and looking at countries that have found themselves innovative ways to include the views and inputs of women and girls in groups that lack representation in their policies, adaptation plans, and interventions. Countries and entities that have achieved levels of equality in regards to the composition of their leadership structure in environment and climate change entities and organizations these should serve as a blueprint and positive example for other countries. We must recognize that women have key skill sets that make them uniquely qualified to play a central role in decision making. And if we are really to see gains in our fight to slow the effects of climate change, we have to begin to tap into all available resources and provide a platform and space for women to contribute to transformative action. In Antigua and Barbuda, we have many women at the highest levels in government. They serve in our cabinet, which is the executive arm of government. They serve in our Senate, which is our upper house. And they also serve in our lower house in government. At these levels, women in Antigua and Barbuda do have a say, and they do play an active role at the highest level in decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister for those very concrete uh, examples of strategies that can be put in place. Um, we are moving to our next panelist, um, Ms. Um, Jennifer Uchendu. You are um, an, a youth activist. Uh, and you have experience working with young people in the fight against uh, climate change. How, the question is, how can we leverage the drive and activism of the youth to mobilize others, to bring others, including private sector, in the fight against climate change. The floor is yours. You have three minutes. 
Thank you very much for the question, Elena. And thank you all for inviting me. Such a privilege to be here with such a high level um, panelist um, speaking about the work that I do with climate activism. Now, one thing we know about young people is that they want, you know, they want a habitable planet. We want a future. You know, I think of myself as a mother to be, and I think of what kind of planet am I going to have for my child? So it's that interest and genuine concern that young people often, you know, put leaders to the floor to say, what are you doing? And we often come up as angry. We often come up as really, really emotional. But you see climate change is an emotional issue for young people. And it's how do we then channel, you know, the passion, the energy, and these emotions that young people have into positive action. And I have a few ideas, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Older people, businesses, corporates need to be willing and ready to have conversations with young people. You know, beyond just um, having them attend events, you need to look at social media, for example, look at pop culture, understand what the pain points for young people are and what are the ideas that they're bringing up in terms of climate action and environmental protection in general. It's in that form of dialogue that you then begin to understand what change means to young people and how you can have them as partners rather than you know having young people generally just protesting. We want to not move from protest to become partners of progress because this is a future that's for us. A second idea is um, very linked to the first one is inclusion you know young people should be part of decision making processes they should be part of you know participatory processes that think through ideas for climate action we don't want to be seen as add-ons you know as you know secondary input makers we want to be part of the process all true because this is a future that is important to us and particularly for businesses and governments this idea of accountability is now coming to fore a lot more. Young people are demanding transparency. We want you to say the truth, you know, give the right data. Don't greenwash your, your activities or your progress. And it's in saying the truth that you then begin to say, these are our shortcomings. This is where we're, you know, failing. And this is what we are doing in terms of our commitment. And young people can then begin to see you for what you truly are a genuine organization who really, really is interested in solidarity. And this idea of solidarity is one that I've been, you know, really interested in. It's not that you're helping young people or you're trying to, you know, do something for young people. It's that we're working together as partners because this is really, really, really important to us. Um, the fourth idea for me is saying the truth. You know, uh, we've often found out that, you know, data, there's a lot of greenwashing, a lot of ideas are being put out. You know, businesses, governments saying, we're going to do this by 2030. But you're not saying the truth because what is your implementation strategy? And young people really, really want to see that blueprint. Were we part of those ideas? Were we part of those decision-making uh, processes? If not, then we're going to keep protesting. We're going to keep calling leaders out on social media and at every chance we have because we don't think you're saying the truth. Um, a fifth and very, very important one for me is this idea of eco-anxiety, which is coming up a lot for young people, particularly youth climate activists. We're saying, to, we're saying to world leaders that there's an emotional and overwhelming toll thinking about the planet you're leaving for us. So we need space to talk about these emotions and we need to safeguard eco-anxiety and what young people are feeling right now, you know, combined with the crisis of COVID-19 and climate change. It's a lot to deal with for young people and we need space to talk about these emotions and how we can foster on for a habitable planet for us all. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh... Ms. Uchendo, it's, it's really a, a pleasure to hear you. Thank you for sharing your uh, concerns, but also your passion. Um, and with that, we are um, with um, done the first round of questions. We are going back uh, now to uh, Madame Ibrahim. Uh, but first, I want to congratulate all the panelists for sticking to time and respecting and being very 
insightful and concise at the same time. So now over to you, um, Madame Ibrahim, we would like to hear from you on what are the good practices in your experience? What are some of the mm, good practices that can be transformational even at the global level based on your experience working at the forefront of climate change with women uh, at the community level? Some of the good practices and experience that you would like to share with us today. The floor is yours, you have three minutes. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, je, je vais te répondre en français cette fois-ci, Elena. So I'm going to speak in French for, for the rest of you to get the interpretations. Uh, je pense que pour cette question d'innovation, on doit d'abord regarder au niveau local. Les niveaux local, les femmes sont des transformatrices déjà, elles sont des actrices, elles ont beaucoup de connaissances et savoirs traditionnels qu'elles apprennent à partir de leur environnement. C'est valable pour toutes les femmes autochtones qui sont dans des différents écosystèmes. Je vous donne l'exemple de ma communauté. Chez moi, quand on donne une solution sur l'environnement, sur la météorologie, s'il va pleuvoir ou s'il ne va pas pleuvoir, les femmes ont des connaissances plus détaillées. Ma grand-mère, ma tante, mes cousines, elles observent les insectes, elles observent les oiseaux et elles peuvent vous dire s'il va pleuvoir dans deux heures. Et elles peuvent vous dire s'il va pleuvoir dans une semaine. Parce qu'elles font ça tous les jours pour pouvoir uh, protéger leur communauté, pour pouvoir avoir la résilience. Ce sont des connaissances très importantes que les femmes ont dans les détails. Bien sûr, les hommes ont des connaissances, mais elles sont beaucoup plus uh, grand, de grands repères. Alors, pour les avoir, il faudrait les mettre dans les plans nationaux d'adaptation. Il faut les mettre dans les CPDN, qui sont les NDC, les, les contributions nationales déterminées. Et là, les États pourront les tourner en programme, ils pourront les tourner en politique qui peuvent les aider à mieux combattre les changements climatiques. Mais au niveau global, on en a aussi la reconnaissance de ces connaissances traditionnelles des peuples autochtones, comme dans l'accord de Paris. L'article 7.5 reconnaît les savoirs des peuples autochtones qui sont très vitaux pour lutter contre le changement climatique. On a aussi les rapports des experts, des IPCC, qui a reconnu que les connaissances des peuples autochtones sont vitales pour la restauration des terres et la lutte contre le changement climatique. Donc, au niveau international, il faudrait que les femmes autochtones, les femmes rurales et celles qui sont en devant du changement climatique et qui sont porteuses des solutions, puissent avoir une table de négociation et un accès pour prendre des décisions. On ne peut pas prendre des décisions à nos places. Comme si nous les premiers impactés, on a des solutions, on doit participer à la prise de décision. Et là, l'exemple de la bonne pratique, je le donne pas parce que Mary est avec nous au panel. Même si elle n'est pas là, je donne cet exemple. Avec Mary Robinson, pour euh, l'accord de Paris, on était ensemble. Elle nous a soutenus. Elle a soutenu la voix des femmes. Elle a pris la voix pour amener aux négociateurs. Et ainsi de suite, et ils sont revenus vers nous. Donc, comment au niveau international, les femmes pourront se soutenir, ceux qui ont plus de pouvoir, ceux qui ont plus de connaissances, ainsi de suite, et on pourra se soutenir pour que nous puissions avoir nos voix écoutées dans les prises de décision. Et c'est comme ça qu'on pourra avoir la transformation et lutter contre le changement climatique en donnant la place à la femme comme leader. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci beaucoup, Madame Ibrahim. Um, and we are moving now to our next uh, panelist. So this question is for Ms. Bidakovic. Um, what is the role of the different stakeholders? This is a fight that involves so many in different spaces. So who should be at the table and which roles for, for each, of, each of us to play from civil society, young feminist governments, private sector, um, which role should each of us play in this, in this uh, coalition um, against uh, climate change? Floor is yours, you have minutes. Thank you, thank you. Usually we get this question being a youth and the creative and culture festival. Uh, we often are asked, uh, how come you're completely devoted entire 
festival for the last five years to issues of sustainable development, uh, climate change, and all other, uh, let's say, social innovation and uh, social coherence. And that was the answer that we felt uh, back then. We were much younger, of course, and I can relate to every every word that Jennifer said. Uh, we needed a dialogue. We needed to really look uh, uh, representatives of the private sector in their eyes to ask questions that were bothering us. How come that industry is not giving our us all the answers. We again wanted to, you know, kind of pull uh, people from the government uh, to their sleeves and tell us you need to come and you need to explain how come the policies that we are having right now, maybe they're perfect on paper, but what really, really is frustrating and that there's no monitoring, there's no implementation. So this is also something frustrating. That's why uh, the, let's say the civil society uh, sector uh, mainly relying on really, really this new power, the youth, youth um, culture is now asking these questions. And there is something, you know, that unifies many di diverse fields of operation now under the umbrella of uh, climate crisis. Nationalists, anti-feminists, climate change deniers, they all have uh, a common interest in preserving these existing power relations, social, economic, political structures. And these forces really often financially, politically are posing serious threats to the change needed for, for equal and sustainable future. We have women and girls at the forefront of all these defending environmental and human right, right um, movements. And even here in Serbia, we know a lot of young women and girls who are actually uh, uh, of facing threats, various forms of violence, because they're really challenging these power structures. So we need more boys and men to really engage in these uh, solutions together with women and girls and of course persons of really all identities. The same way we need more women uh, to be really led to leading positions in companies, in governments. And uh, maybe one of the big conclusions we had last year at the festival, on all these positions, there are people. We need to find people in each of these roles. We need to talk to, to fathers that are sitting in our government. We need to talk to people who are actually also consuming the products that are uh, actually their companies and uh, big national uh, Con, uh, consortiums are actually producing. And of course, the NGO sector has this really important role of being a correctional element. We need to be the eye opener and we need to really lead the education, awareness raising, and a big battle that is awaiting us in Serbia conquer the media. And we, we, we're actually now, for instance, talking and negotiating with the um, guardian to give uh, programs for our journalists that really we can put uh, topics really up front but not in a pessimistic way but in rather motivating and empowering way that we can really still make a difference thank you thank you thank you very much uh, uh, miss bitakovich and um, over to to your uh, um, to your excellency um, Mrs. Robinson, um, you we've heard uh, that it's. Uh, I think Madame Miranda said before it's impossible to dissociate uh, the pandemic from the climate emergency. We've also heard Jennifer talk about eco anxiety, and in the context of this double crisis, what can we learn from feminism, and, and what can we do to support our young female? and um, climate justice activist in, in, in this fight. Over to you, you have three minutes. Thank you, Elena. It's such an important question. I think about it a lot, and I'm glad that it's part of our discussion. We need to recognize that there is a double burden, that people are exhausted, they're anxious, they're, uh, and young people in particular, as Jennifer said, feel the burden of wondering if they have a safe future. So. We, you know, part of feminism is self-care. The idea that we not only care for ourselves and within our family, but also care for, care for each other. 
support each other in our feminism. It's just so important. I'm not going to take my full three minutes because I think we're a little bit running short of time. I'm, I'm just going to say that I often ask an audience to take three steps. The first step I don't need to say to this audience, we need to make the climate crisis personal in our lives and do something to show we've done that um, by changing our recycling habits or our eating habits or doing something you know, concrete. And then we own the problem and that helps our anxiety because we're part of the solution. The second step is to get angry with those who have more responsibility and aren't doing enough. And that's governments, cities, etc. The third step, and Jennifer hinted at this in looking to the future, we need to imagine this future much more than we do. We need to hurry towards it. We want to get there. It will be much healthier. Um, Hindu will have greened the, the Sahel with ecological ideas with other women. Um, we'll see you know, what happens in rural areas, what happens in indigenous communities, the wisdom of indigenous communities in, you know, in, in, in living closely with nature. That, that's the solution. So uh, in essence, uh, we need far more thought about um, being human with each other, being compassionate, having empathy with each other. Uh, Jennifer mentioned solidarity. That's also very important. And we need to imagine this world we have to hurry towards. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Mulenke, same question to you. What can we learn from feminism and uh, what can we do to support our feminist advocates in, this, uh, in the context of this double crisis? Thank you very much. I think uh, Her Excellency Madam Robinson has already made it very clear that uh, feminism, feminists have really done a lot of work and the most important thing for us is to work together. To, they continue providing a lot of support for indigenous women, for women in the rural areas, and for even the youth. And I'm really so glad today the, uh, Jennifer talked about the youth and why we should include them. Because for us, uh, working in the remote area with the COVID that was, uh, has and has been hitting us for long, the only solution was to try and work together, listen to each other, and uh, give each other support. And the feminist world has really also come to support us. We have partners like Madre and others who have really, FEMI, the International Indigenous Women Forum, who have come up to really make sure that indigenous women at the remote areas have been able to get extra help, extra funding, extra resource mobilization, how to work it, capacity building so that they can be able to really manage such situation. A human rights approach is very, very important at this time as we go to COP26. We must make sure that we work together as a team. Private governments, as Mary Robinson had said earlier, they must recognize the role played by indigenous women and all the human uh, people wherever they are because it's very important at any corner they are, life is very important. Living harmony with nature is very important. And that's why indigenous women, wherever we've been and the ones we've been working with, restoration has been a very important crucial part. They know that they need the forest. They know they need the medicine so that they can be able to bring that knowledge of medicinal uh, plants and uh, uh, medicine to our women at the community level. We know that the health and the food depends on that particular forest. So it's very important for us to really think, what do we need? And how can we work? And the feminists have a role to do that. They have a role to mobilize. Whether you are at the international level, help down to your sisters at the South and work together in a way that we can be able to all uh, live and live the world a better world. Again, don't work alone. We need to bring the youth, the family, even the children. Remember now with COVID, most of the time the children are in, at home. What should they do? Involve them involve the youth completely to take their role. And that's the way they can learn the knowledge that we have already at the community level. So I would say this is very, very important for us. And I think uh, we are going to the right direction. And I really thank the forum for bringing such a, a discussion at this po point at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madame Mulenke. Um, Senora Miranda, we are now back to you again with a question about the different um, actors in this uh, space and, and who should be at the table and what role for each of us in this uh, um, coalition 
against uh, uh, climate change. So what role for civil society, young feminist governments, private sector, who should be there and which role for each of us? Um, the floor is yours. Uh, you have three minutes. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, escuchando eh, sobre este tema, yo me pregunto siempre cómo estos debates y estas discusiones pueden generarse, digamos, conciencia en la mayoría de la gente, porque creo que es el grave problema y quiero dar un ejemplo. O sea, Muchos niños y niñas hoy día no saben y no entienden que la comida no, com no crece en el supermercado. No saben que la comida crece en el campo. Que hay que sembrarla en el campo que requiere agua, que requiere unas ciertas condiciones. Y ese es un reto mayúsculo. Por ejemplo, ¿cómo podemos lograr que la mayoría de los seres humanos entendamos que el, pl que el plástico está devorando el planeta? Y eso es algo diario minuto a minuto, segundo a segundo, y entonces la mayoría de la gente lo siente como normal, la plastificación de todo. Esa es una cosa grave, y tiene que ver con la crisis climática. Y yo creo que en ese sentido, cuando hablamos de incorporar voces, creo que debemos de generar mesas nacionales de debate, discusión, análisis, de construcción de rutas para abordar el tema del cambio climático o la crisis climática. Mesas en las cuales participen todos los sectores, todos, habidos y por haber, para no solamente hablar sobre la crisis que se refleja siempre en las inundaciones y las sequías. Tenemos que también generar debate para redefinir el concepto de desarrollo. Tenemos que generar debate para redefinir el modelo de consumo. Tenemos que generar debate para redefinir el modelo de producción que nos está poniendo en peligro cada día. Entonces me parece que es importante, señores y señoras, impulsar, pero ya, ahora, mesas nacionales para abordar el tema de la crisis climática. Honduras, acabamos de ser golpeados por la tormenta tropical Eta y Iota, y se está haciendo la misma práctica. Es decir, que no nos enseñó la Eta y Iota para darnos cuenta que tenemos que cambiar patrones, costumbres, porque no podemos repetir lo mismo porque del otro año o este año a final de noviembre 2020 vamos a enfrentar de nuevo un una embate de eh, huracán y que nos va a dejar en las mismas condiciones. Entonces me parece que es importante que establezcamos esos niveles de discusión, pero también búsqueda de alternativas, estrategias en la cual no solo genere la conciencia, sino que también podamos generar cambios hacia el futuro para poder garantizar la sobrevivencia de la humanidad. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, thank you. Muchas gracias, señora, señora Miranda. Next question. Um, we are moving towards the action part of the discussion, recommendations, uh, what to do to address many of the challenges that we, we have discussed so far. Um, our next panelist is uh, uh, Honorable De Minister Dean Jonas. Um, the question to you, um, Minister, is what could be your recommendations to make uh, uh, a reality this feminist agenda for climate justice? What would be the key priorities and recommendations that you would select um, to make this a reality? Over to you, um, you have three minutes. But um, hello, yes, good afternoon. And um, we, it is important for various stakeholders. And again, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of the panel and to discuss these important matters. And it is important for all our stakeholders within the fight for environmental justice to work collaboratively. If the work of stakeholders such as civil society and young feminists and government and private sector is not cohesive, it leads to duplication of efforts and, and wasted resources. Our civil society actors should be at the forefront of efforts against the environmental crisis that we're grappling with, as they have the ability to utilize various platforms to advocate for policy, programming and action that will lead to positive change and improvement within our environmental and climate change um, adaptation and mitigation efforts. 
young people and young feminists in particular are also important as they not only engage in activism and awareness, um, raising on behalf of women and vulnerable groups, they also hold governments and environmental entities accountable about the level of gender sensitivity present in our policies and laws relevant to the environment and climate change. The private sector also has a role to play as they often have the financial resources to assist, to assist our governments and other environmental stakeholders in the fight towards ending the crisis we find ourselves in. They provide sector, the sector, the private sector, sorry, also has the ability to implement internal policies and regulations that ensure that their institutions are not contributing to global degradation and that they're playing their part in improving our prospects for recovery by being responsible in the way they operate their businesses. Governments also play a critical role as the onus is upon us in government to be one of the central and coordinating bodies that ensure that we are proactive in tackling these environmental challenges from all angles, ranging from a policy standpoint right down to having a role in the community level and grassroots actions that are taking place. Government must also find and allocate substantial resources towards improving the environment and ensuring that we have regulations, protocols, and enforcement mechanisms in place so we can achieve sustainable gains. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And now the same question for um, to Secretaria Delgado. So in your opinion, what are the main recommendations, the priorities that we need to put in place to make sure that this feminist agenda for climate justice becomes a reality? Muchas gracias. Primero que nada, me parece que hay que reconocer que las mujeres somos 51% de la población del mundo. Esto eh, pues es una reflexión importante porque la justicia climática pasa también por una eh, situación de vulnerabilidad muy grande de las mujeres. Las relaciones de género han precondicionado las habilidades sociales eh, para que las mujeres puedan anticiparse, prepararse, sobrevivir, resistir y recuperarse de los desastres naturales o de las situaciones que se están siendo provocadas por el cambio climático. Eh, para cumplir con lo que establece la Plataforma de Acción de Beijing, es importante que las estrategias eh, de combate al cambio climático, todas incluyan unas perspectivas importantes de género y, por supuesto, también incluyan las ideas y las propuestas de las mujeres. Eh, me parece que también en, en, otra, en otro orden de ideas es indispensable pensar en que se incorpore la perspectiva de los derechos humanos de las mujeres y de las niñas en las políticas públicas, en las medidas y eh, en todas las estrategias para el combate al cambio climático. Creo que el plan eh, de acción de cambio climático y género derivado de la COP25 en Madrid es un buen inicio y me quisiera concentrar en que este enfoque eh, promueva y fomente una plena efectiva participación de las mujeres, jóvenes y niñas, eh, una distribución equitativa de los apoyos que la población necesita para enfrentar estas crisis climáticas, el fortalecimiento de la buena gobernanza y del de liderazgo de las mujeres, las jóvenes y las niñas en, esto, en esta agenda, el promover un acceso equitativo y un acceso que sea relevante a la información necesaria para la toma de decisiones y también eh, mitigar los riesgos para las mujeres defensoras de los derechos eh, de, de, la, de las mujeres y del medio ambiente. Esas son algunas de las cuestiones que creo que hay que hacer. Eh, garantizar que la perspectiva de género se implemente en estas políticas públicas es, uh, tam, pasa también por promover una gestión sostenible de los recursos naturales y de considerar el rol que tienen los ecosistemas en la resiliencia que tienen las comunidades y eh, también, por supuesto, 
eh, pues los hábitats naturales de las diferentes especies. Quisiera terminar diciendo que México se ha sumado entusiastamente el acuerdo de Escazú, es un acuerdo regional de América Latina y el Caribe para garantizarle a la comunidad de estos países eh, el acceso a la información, a la participación social y a la justicia ambientales. Este acuerdo se va a implementar el 22 de abril en toda la región latinoamericana. México es muy entusiasta de la posibilidad de poder implementar estos principios de acceso a la justicia, participación social e información. Este es el inicio de la justicia climática también para las mujeres y en general para la, la población en general. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señora Delgado. Thank you and congratulations on, on the signature of such an important agreement. Um, we are winding up the, 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 the discussion and we have now our final question. Jennifer, um, uh, Ms. Uchendu, you have the opportunity um, to intervene and tell us, again, any final thoughts, but also what are your proposals, your recommendation, actions uh, that you would suggest as priorities to make this feminist agenda for climate justice uh, a reality. Over to you, um, Jennifer, you have three minutes. Thank you, Elena. Thank you so much for the question and really, really appreciate all of the feedback and inputs that has come from um, everyone moving forward. Each time I think of questions like this, I ask myself reflectingly, what does it mean to be a young African female climate activist in a world like this, you know, the intersectionality that plays a part when I think of my role, you know, in all of these different spaces. In terms of solutions and moving forward, I feel like we know a lot of the answers. How do we move from conversations to action? How do we move from implementation? Who are the actors who need to be supported? How do we identify them and how do we track action immediately? You know, I'm a good, I'm a big fan of, you know, staying by 2030, but I found out that, you know, 2015 would come and meet us. 2030 would come and meet us and these actions wouldn't have been taken. Right now, today, after now, all of these ideas that have been brought forward, what can we do? Who do we need to you know, invest in? Who, who needs to be supported right now? And how do we track action? So basically for me, it's for us to move from you know, talk to action, credible, you know, um, strong action that we can hit the ground running immediately. And like I said earlier, young people are passionate and energetic and are willing to become partners of progress with climate action. So therefore they need to be supported. They need to be, you know, given space to um, try out their inno innovation. Experimentation has to come to play with climate action particularly with youth feminists, we can tap into, you know, the ideas and experiences of our mothers, Her Excellency Mary Robinson and Madam Lucy, you know, explicitly have said to us, you know, self-care. So we're going to care for ourselves a lot more, but we want to act, we want to be supported, we want to be empowered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. And this closes the uh, panel section of our um, discussion today. And thanks to the impressive performance of our panelists in time management, we have the opportunity now to open the floor for questions. Participants, we are right now 107 and almost 180 participants in this event. They've been very active uh, asking questions. So we have selected a few of them for our panelists. So the first question is quite um, provocative and, and, and perhaps difficult to, to answer. Uh, it's for um, your, um, your excellency, in Madame Robinson. So the question is, what makes you think that this year governments will be willing to really take measures if they haven't complied with promises they've made before? How can we hold them accountable and make them really do something for the sake of our planet, climate and humanity? Over to you for your thoughts, uh, Your Excellency. 
It is a, a very key question uh, because it's such an important year, as I mentioned. What has changed is, is leadership in the United States. Uh, we had four bad years of no leadership. And now we have the Biden administration, uh, Biden-Harris administration, coming in a different way. Planning a climate summit on, on Earth Day, which is on the 22nd of April. And that will be when the United States, either at that conference or just before it, will indicate what it is going to do with ambition this year. And there is, as you know, much more emphasis on Green New Deal, on climate policy than ever before in the United States. This will influence China, which has made a commitment to be net zero emissions by 2060, at least, which is very significant. I think they can be pushed, especially with their five-year plan now, which doesn't seem to be fully aligned with that commitment long-term. The, the five-year plan is more about using fossil fuel for a recovery from COVID. And that's the danger that countries will try to recover rapidly from the impact of COVID, the lockdowns, and use fossil fuel because it's handy. Whereas we know that clean energy is now cheaper, becoming more available, but it needs effort, it needs thought, it needs ambition. And that's what we need to call for all of us together, all of us as feminists, all of us as young people, all of us as elders like myself, intergenerationally, we have to put pressure to make sure it happens. Thank you, thank you for your thoughts, uh, Your Excellency. The next question is about climate finance and how to leverage those climate funds to make them more gender responsive and, and to, to really benefit women. Um, any thoughts uh, from the panel um, about that? Um, perhaps, Honorable Minister, would you like to, to share your views on that? And after that, any other members of the panel can contribute? Honorable Minister Jonas, would you like to share your views on how, a, how can we make climate finance work for women and make more climate finance flow to women organizations and women-led businesses and women cooperatives on the ground? I yeah. think you are mute. Yes, I'm sorry. I am. Um... I, I listen keenly, and um, I'm glad again for the opportunity to respond to this. Um, I can speak for what we do uh, in Antigua. OK, are you hearing me OK? I, I think you are now. Feedback. Now, um, in Antigua, what we're doing is, in order to to get more financing available, particularly for women and to, to, to move the agenda forward. There must be legitimate business plans and legitimate um, business opportunities that are created for women to ensure that they can take a part in, in, in changes that are happening. I am currently the Minister for Gender Affairs in Antigua, and I'm also the Minister for the Blue Economy. There are a number of measures that we're taking that are related to the Blue Economy in getting more and more women involved in investment opportunities um, from the grassroots level. We actually do have programs in place that are based on energy and also aquaculture, where more and more women are becoming involved in these um, functions that will enable them to build their business in a sustainable way and fix a lot of the environment and climate that are affecting them. When women are, are become the owners of businesses, decision makers, um, it, it is a form of empowerment that enables them to use these resources and their family. So one of the key areas that we're doing right now that is not that, for example, in the agriculture sector, 
Um, there are a lot of women who don't like to do agricultural field work, but they will take part in aquaponics. Aquaponics is a different way of farming that doesn't involve soil farming, involves raising fish and plants, using some technology that enables them to produce the same amount of food and fish products as a traditional farmer without having the, what would I call the backbreaking work of um, engaging in farming. A lot of women in Antigua and Barbuda are now doing this and uh, that, uh, that are helping them to, uh, to invest in that sort of thing. Another key area where a lot of funding is taking place, and I know that my daughter is also doing something like that, is in, um, is in information technology. And um, you know, she, she does coding and has built up her own business in logistics and coding. And there are many, many young women in our little island that are also engaging in that sort of thing that will enable them. So um, they're able then when they have a proper business plan, when they have a, a business development strategy, they're able to get funding through local banks, through credit unions, and through other financial institutions that will enable them to fund their business. And that is one of the key things that my ministry is currently working on to enable them through what we call business incubators to be able to set these businesses up and they have a like a one-stop shop where we help them to go through the entire process of planning, um, business development, and also getting financing to fund their various business projects. And so we're very actively engaged with many, many young women and um, women leaders to develop their business, small businesses in that area. I hope that that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting response. And thank you for sharing the experience of what you are doing uh, in your country. Um, so it can inspire others uh, to, to, to follow example and, and put some of these recommendations in place as well. I think with that, we have um, run out of time for um, questions and answer. There is a very interesting debate in the, in the chat and in the, uh, in the comments through, through the contributions of the different participants. And we really appreciate uh, all the feedback and, and, the, and the contributions. But we are going to move now uh, to the wrap up uh, of the session with some closing remarks by um, Sweden's Secretary of State for De International Development, Ms. Janine and, uh, Eriksson. Uh, thank you for being with us today. You have the very difficult task of trying to capture such a rich uh, discussion, and we are looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. The floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much to all the panelists for sharing their experiences and uh, thoughts on this very important matter. Uh, I'm very thankful to have been invited to this seminar because uh, this is really important that we start to look at these issues of gender equality and climate change uh, more holistically. And uh, also, as was said earlier, with all the injustices and all the different layers that are in this. And if we just start here with climate and women and gender equality, we have come uh, a bit further. And so I just want to say a few things about where we are. Uh, and we all know really where we are, but we are still in the pandemic, which causes a lot of harm and uh, are really bad to people and communities and economy, as you know. But now we have to see that we can uh, deal with the pandemic and uh, get the world vaccinated. And in doing that, we also have to make sure that we build healthier, uh, health, better health systems, stronger and with better capacities. That will also help us to rebuild build back or build forward, as was said, which I think is a very much better way to put the words uh, because we need a future to look forward to. 
And this is, I think, the way to do that. But we know that the pandemic has been very harmful uh, to many uh, parts of the society, but not as least to women. We have all heard the effects that are awful to hear about with uh, increased violence and uh, girls not getting their education uh, and a lot of uh, really pressing issues that needs to be dealt with as fast as possible, because this is an unbearable situation where we see the development not going forward, not bringing more equality, but pushing it back. Uh, but in doing this, we have to build greener. And that means that we cannot just do the fast way and use the fossil fuels now. We have to do it greener in both climate ways, but also uh, for better biodiversity, because otherwise we will not have uh, a planet to do all the other things that we have to do. Uh, in the Agenda 2030, we have set up the goals. We know where we want to go. And even if we now have a setback, that is still our mutual goals. And what is most important to deal with is climate and biodiversity loss. Because if we do not deal with that, we do not have a planet to rebuild even more and to come to, to the means of all the social impact uh, targets either. But gender equality is also very crucial because it is, uh, of course, very important in its own because women's rights are human rights and we have to really press this agenda forward and not letting it go backwards. But as it is uh, on its own, it's also a means to better reach the goals of, uh, of what I've been talking to here today. So we have to make sure that we are involving women actively in environmental decision making at all levels, from the beginning, from all the experiences and the testimonies and what is needed, what is, what is the capabilities, uh, and all the way to putting them at the table be in the decision-making and, and also can see the implementation of what they have um, decided. Uh, we have to make sure we're integrating their perspectives and concerns because otherwise we will not succeed uh, since we know that women, as, and as you all have given us testimonies and thoughts about today, is that we have, here is a, a capacity that we can just not let uh, go uh, unused because then we will really waste uh, a lot of ideas and knowledge. And we have to establish ways. And uh, many of you have been into those ways to, to make sure that uh, all these uh, environmental policies also reach women, children and youth, of course, because that is the way to really reach this future. Guarantee equal participation uh, eliminate in equal access to education and, of course, access to land is also very important for enhancing women's uh, capacities here. We have to have reliable data uh, that disagrees by sex and, and age to see that what is happening to women and youth here. Uh, and that is also what we in the Swedish uh, foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy is trying to do, really always mainstreaming gender uh, and make that a commitment of more governments, uh, but also to mainstream uh, environment and climate. And to make these agendas inclusive and get power out of each other so that we get uh, a stronger future for us all. And I feel very hopeful after listening to you today because we have so much knowledge and championship and, uh, and um, wisdom. So I think that with all our uh, work, if we do it together, we can absolutely make it and have a future to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Secretary, for those uh, inspiring words. And with this, um, I would like to thank you all. Um, first of all, our panelists for sharing your ideas, your contribution to this important discussion today. Um, also, would like to thank all the participants that um, stayed with us uh, 
for the discussion for an hour and a half and contributed uh, with their different opinions and, and questions. And also um, to the government of, Me of Mexico for hosting us and creating this important space for us to, to discuss and, and to co-create solutions in this important uh, fight. And uh, to the technical teams that have made uh, this possible, interpreters um, and technicians and, and the in mujeres and UN women's teams behind the event. Um, this is only the first day of an exciting historic forum. Please go ahead and continue enjoying discussions and participating uh, in events in the next two days. And with us, with that, I would like to thank you all and wish you uh, a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Great discussion. Thank you. Really thank good. You. Bye bye. <laughs>